today something a little different. However, we will touch upon music. We're talking about understanding the mental health crisis and how your relationships can save you. Now, what we're talking about here is a social imperative. There is something that I want you to do, but it's going to be backed up by science. Science about how your relationships affect your brain. And what you will find is that your relationships help release good brain chemicals for you to keep you living in mental health, love and compassion. Caroline and I have the pleasure of living near a beach. We're on the Sunshine Coast at the moment and often we go for a walk on the beach. Good grief, I was there this morning. Uh, but it was only a few weeks ago when we were walking along and Caroline says to me, look at all these beautiful shells. What a pity that they're all broken. And unfortunately, that's a bit like the society that we're living in at the moment. I and a lot of people like me get to see the broken shells. They're beautiful shells, but they have been broken because they get picked up by society's waves and they get smashed. And I get to see them. And it's heartbreaking. It really is. We should be swimming in a wonderful, wonderful society because we are part of a wonderful, wonderful society. There has never been a better time to be alive. And yet, we are drowning in a sea of mental illness and mental health issues. Why? That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to talk about what you as individuals can do about it. And I'm going to back that up by science, particular, particularly neurochemistry. All right, so tonight I'm going to talk about the mental health crisis. I will give you a few statistics. I will talk about why we're there, but I'm going to spend most of my time talking about four chemicals in your brain, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. And I'm going to let you know how you can optimize these in your mind, particularly using relationships. I want to give you some context first. The life expectancy of developed nations around 1800 was 40. By the time we got to 1900, it was 50. By 1970, we're pushing it up to 70 years old. Now, life expectancy in developed nations is 80. And there's a flow-on effect to developing nations as well. Gross domestic product was pretty flat per capita until about 1800. Then, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, we doubled the gross domestic product per capita, per person, by 1900, it was doubled. Last century, we've increased 30-fold. It is incredible how prosperous we have been. Medically, we have done incredibly well. Economically, we have done incredibly well. Let's just go to the last 25 years. Non-violent crime in, developing, in developed nations in the last 25 years has halved. Violent crime in societies like ours has been steadily decreasing for the last 25 years. There has never been a better time to be alive. If longevity, economic prosperity and safety meant happiness, we would all be delirious. But we're not. As I said, we're swimming in this sea of mental illness and we all have to learn to do CPR. CPR, put community before careers. Put people before productivity. Put relationships before riches. But we don't. And I will go so far as to say that the statistics that I'm going to talk about now are the price that we are paying for what we believe is continued economic prosperity. And we have to ask ourselves, why are we doing all of this if it's not to increase our happiness and well-being? So here come the statistics, all right? I'm going to start off with depression, which the World Health Organization calls the number one problem, burden of global disability in the world today. That means it's the number one problem. 
in a three-year period, 2013 to, th to 2016, depression in people under the age of 35 increased by 47%. In people under the age of 18, it increased by 63%. In three years, that's absolutely mind-boggling. Anxiety. Anxiety in children. Four-year-old children are now presenting as anxious. It has increased by 20% in a 10-year period. There are some leading researchers that are calling for this to be called the age of anxiety. Deliberate self-harm. This is where particularly young females in societies like ours, they cut themselves. If you're living in a society that is happy, you do not go around cutting yourselves. It has increased by 28% in a 10-year period. Addictions has increased by 12% in a 10-year period. Uh, the USA in particular is going through an opioid crisis at the moment and steadily addictions are rising. And then there's the big one, suicide. In Australia, more than 2,000 people die at their own hands every year. In the USA, it's over 45,000 that increased by 4% in one year. Now, the strange thing about suicide is if you look at the suicide rates through all of the 20th century, they were basically the same. Stayed pretty much on an even keel. Since 1999, however, the suicide rate in the world has gone up by 33%. There is up to a million people in the world per year that end their own lives. And this is with our economic prosperity, with our medical technology, and with our safety. What, what is happening? For the first time in a long time, life expectancy in the USA went down. Now, this is in an age when we're finding cures for cancer, where we're starting to win the war on heart disease. Uh, a lot of people are giving up smoking. Why? Because of two reasons. Number one is suicide. And number two is drug overdoses. They are both mental health problems. So how do we get to this stage? All right, I'm the first to put up my hand to say yes. Some of it is better detection. We are finding out more people that are depressed so that we can actually help them. But not these sort of rates, all around the whole of the spectrum of mental disorders. Uh, genetics, uh, our genetic makeup hasn't changed appreciably in about 60,000 years. So when you see rate rises like this, it has very little to do with genetics. No, it's our environment. There is something in the way that we are living, in the way that we are structuring, organizing, and living in our society that is driving these rates of mental illness. Do we have any evidence that that's the case? Yes, we do. In 1960, 65, I haven't quite seen this um, firsthand. This is in a book that I read. When they introduced television to Tonga, now Tonga is a nation of some of the most happy people in the world, Depression rates increased significantly. Why? Because there were questions like this. Hey, Chief, how come we don't have the sort of stuff that they've got on those television shows? All of a sudden, you had happy people being disgruntled. In Fiji, when they introduced television there, anorexia rates went up because young females sort of saw, oh, is that what you've got to look like to be accepted in this world. Better start losing some weight. We have a study from the 1990s that showed the more you make status, appearances, and money your aims in life, the higher your chances of being depressed. That was in the 90s, and I'm sorry, we've gone further in that direction. Uh, two years ago, there was a study that was released that showed that depression and television use are connected. Now, that's not saying that television use causes depression. That's saying if you're depressed, you're likely to watch television. If you watch television, there's more of a chance that you're going to be in that area called depression. 
So we do have scientific evidence that shows that it is actually the environment. What is it about our environment? Well, productivity is up. The economy is up. Technology is up. But so are change and loneliness and uncertainty and disconnect and trust and confidence in governments and the people around us are down. And they are not my words, they're the words from the United Nations in a report of 2012. Here is the bottom line. We have become money rich but meaning poor. We have become commodity rich but community poor. We have become productivity rich and focused and people poor and focused. I have a friend who does some work for Medicines Sans Frontières in Africa and she was over there helping a woman in a village who was having a physical crisis and they got to talking and the woman asks my friend, oh, how's your family? And my friend said, well, my family's actually in Scotland. I don't get to see them too much because I married somebody who lives in Australia. And she said, oh, you poor girl. Oh, no, no, I get to see my mum probably about once a year. No, 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 you poor, poor girl. This was somebody living in poverty in Africa, calling my friend a poor, poor girl. She says, because when I am ill, the whole village is ill with me. You poor, poor girl. And she started to realise that, yes, when it comes to people, when it comes to that side of life, we're the ones that are looking poor. All right, now I've brought the tone sort of down quite a lot because I've given you all the bad news first. And that is a lot of bad news. But stay tuned for the good news because we are living in the best of times. There is no time in the world's history that you would want to be alive other than now. And we have the opportunities to make it even better. As a psychiatrist, however, what I'm going to share with you is what you can do as individuals in each of your own lives to be able to improve that situation so that up here can be mental health, love and compassion. Not just for you, but for the people around you. And just so that it doesn't get too scientific, uh, Caroline's actually going to perform a few things for us tonight so we can experience some of these brain chemicals ourselves. And the brain chemicals that I'm talking about are dopamine, which mediate our experience of pleasure, and oxytocin, which mediates our experience of love and trust. Serotonin, which mediates our feelings of, ah, relax, be at home. And endorphins, which, I'll, I'll, I'll reinvent endorphins for you. It'll put a smile on your face, some of the things that I have to talk about endorphins. Okay, these are my target brain chemicals. When I work with somebody in psychotherapy, I actually want them to experience pleasure for dopamine, trust when it comes to oxytocin, serotonin, well I've got medications that, that, that work on that system, okay, uh, and endorphins so that we remain connected because that's really what endorphins are about. But let's start with dopamine. Dopamine, pleasure. Let me take you inside the brain. Let me take you to the feeling part of your brain. The front part of your brain is the thinking part of your brain. Deep inside the middle, the limbic system, is the feeling part of your brain. And we have what's called the reward pathway. The reward pathway starts in the ventral tegmental area, which is a, a fancy Latin way of sort of saying uh, the front bit of the part near the tent which kind of holds the brain in place. Okay, that's where the dopamine gets made. Then there are all these pathways that go through the limbic system to the nuclear accumbens where as far as we know, that's where we experience pleasure. But how a chemical ends up in us feeling something that we call pleasure, we haven't the foggiest idea. <laughs> right? I, I just need to let you know that. Right? But Nature has evolved this in us for a specific purpose because nature wants us to survive. In fact, every pleasure that nature gives us is linked for survival. Food. Food tastes 
wonderful. I don't think I have met a carbohydrate that I haven't liked. <laughs> Why does food taste so wonderful? Because it is nutritious, because it is good for your survival. If you have ever been out on a long walk or in the desert with a horse with no name and you find some water, that water tastes so good, better than anything else you have ever drunk. You get a lot of dopamine pleasure. Why? Because nature wants you to remember this. It is good for your survival. Then, sex. Sex is an immense pleasure for most all of us. Why? Well, nature gets a chance to spawn another generation, doesn't it? It just gives a chance, if you want that or not. But it's also, also there for us to keep in relationship, to help keep relationships together. Then if you look at anything that we actually enjoy doing, playing cards, making music, playing sports, it's all actually there as pleasure so that we can enjoy being with each other because our social cohesion, getting on well with each other, is so important for our collective survival. And here's the thing about pleasure, we take those things for granted. We have taken family for granted, friends for granted, and we've left them behind because we think they're always going to be there. And unfortunately, we're in a situation where perhaps they're not always going to be there. The other thing that we've learned to do as clever little humans is we isolate the pleasure. Give me the pleasure without the purpose. Now, nature always gives you pleasure for a purpose, for survival. You've got to put some effort in to get that pleasure. But when we learned to manufacture amphetamines in the boot of a car, we were able to give our brain huge, huge pleasure hits for no effort whatsoever and for no purpose whatsoever. That's why it becomes so addictive. For thousands of years, we've been trying to get the pleasure of sex without the responsibility, the effort or the consequences. And quite frankly, we get into trouble when we do that. But I'm going to use artificial sweeteners as an example. Because you know what, if I can get the taste without the consequences, without the calories, that's got to be good, yeah? Unfortunately, there are always consequences. There are side effects. Some artificial sweeteners have been linked to cancers. Some artificial sweeteners actually have been linked to obesity. So it's hard to try to get the pleasure without the purpose or to disconnect pleasure and purpose. So I just wanted to tell you a story of somebody that I took care of. Well, this is actually the story of quite a number of people that I've taken care of, but I will call this woman Kayla. Kayla was 25 when I saw her and she had won a genetic lottery. As far as what the world wants in looks for a female, she had it. In fact, she told me that if she was two inches taller, she would have been worth $10 million. Okay, that's how much she knew about how she looked. So her pleasure became businessmen that had a lot of money, they could take her first to restaurants, then trips overseas, then yachting adventures. Uh, she was a catalyst to three divorces. Uh, then her pleasure became cocaine, because you need a lot of money when your pleasure becomes cocaine. By the time she came to see me, she said, my life is a train wreck. Could you please help me get back on track? So we stabilized her situation and I asked Kayla, Kayla, is this the life you want to be living? She goes, hell no. This is so much pain. I said, Kayla, what do you really want out of life? She said, Kayla, uh, she said, Christian, there are four things I want out of life. I want a man who will love me for me and not my body. I want to be a good mum one day. I want to have some self-respect and I want to have a decent job that pays some decent money. I said, okay, we can work on that. And we worked together for about two years. Occasionally I still get a postcard from Kayla. She is married to somebody that she knows loves her. She doesn't have children yet. She studied and she is now a hairdresser. The money that she earns gives her self-respect. And that is the pleasure that she wants. She wants the pleasure of relationships and being somewhere in the world. She wants the pleasure of cutting somebody's hair and getting into conversation with women she may not know or she may get to know. She left what the world looks at to be tremendous pleasure. She left all that behind. She fought to leave it to get these pleasures. So here is my 
take home message for dopamine. I love pleasure. Have all the pleasure you want, but link it to a purpose. When you link pleasure and purpose, you have a winning combination for your brain. Because when you put in the effort and then you get the pleasure, your brain goes, okay, let's put in a bit more effort to get a bit more pleasure. And you do, and it will drive you into the future. So basically, work first, play later. And if you link your pleasure with purpose so that you have your drinks with your friends on a Friday night, not first thing on a Monday morning, or you get onto the internet after you've done the university assignment, you find some way of linking the pleasure with purpose. And then if you can link it with people, because relationships give you so much pleasure, but we take it all for granted. So that's dopamine. I should go on to oxytocin now, but we have a little treat with you for oxytocin, so I'm going to just shelve it for a while. I'm going to go on to serotonin. Serotonin is something that a lot of you will know about because our antidepressants these days are mainly serotonin react reuptake inhibitors. And if this is the general population, then about 20% of us here would be on an antidepressant. But it works by giving you a little serotonin boost. There are lots of things that give you serotonin boosts. Sunshine, walking on the beach, smiles, talking with people, playing cards, listening to music, wearing something that keeps you warm. These all give you serotonin boosts. Trouble is that we live in a world of stress. We live in a world of key performance indicators, bottom lines, productivity. We live in a world of financial stress, time stress, family stress, social stress. We live in a world of a fear of missing out, a fear of other people and fear of the future, so much so that could we stop the world because a lot of us want to get off. Now what happens when you're under that chronic stress is you activate one side of your autonomic nervous system. It's what a lot of you will know as the fight or flight syndrome. Now this means that you release certain hormones in your blood system, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol, which gives you that shaky feeling of anxiety, ready to run away if you have to, or fight a lion if you have to. The trouble is that lions don't prowl our streets anymore. But loneliness and disconnect, they roam our streets. Now, something's happened to the sound just here. It, no? Okay. You're hearing, you're hearing fine? Okay. And so this is what the autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight system is being activated by. This is what's making us all stressed. Now, these hormones have a very specific uh, job to do. They're to give you energy for a short period of time. So what they do is they shut down long-term things, all right? So stop digestion for a while, okay? We need the blood in our arms and our legs, okay? They also say to you, stop the immune system for a while, we need the energy elsewhere. Now, all of us in this room, we produce cancer cells every second, but our immune systems are so good, as soon as they're produced, gone, gone, gone. That's what happens. But if, if we're under chronic stress and the immune system just hangs back too much, then it's just not quite good at taking out all the cancer cells. I have just given you a mechanism for which our modern stress leads to cancers. And our evidence is heading in that direction. That is what actually happens. The other thing that stress does is it suppresses serotonin production. Serotonin is produced in what's called the RAFE nuclei in our brainstem. Now, in our brainstem, all our attention is there. What's called the reticular formation is in our brainstem. So serotonin is very primitive. It's a very old part of us and it's got to do with our whole alertness and how we see ourselves in all of our environment, how we see ourselves in our society. If you're sort of going, oh, I'm wondering if I fit in, I wonder if people will accept me, that is going to bring your serotonin levels down. What you need is serotonin levels to go, chill, relax, feel at home. That's when you boost your serotonin levels. I treat a lot of people who have come back from war situations and have experienced trauma. I will talk about this person, call them 
Marty. Marty came back from Afghanistan and he was stressed. He was angry. He took to alcohol like nobody else. He had incredible arguments with his partner and with his son. And I'll get back to that a bit later. And we had to get on top of his anxiety. And yes, there are medications that help, but medication is not all of the answer. I had to teach Marty to breathe. Because when you breathe, you don't just oxygenate your whole body and your brain, you actually leave space for your awareness in your brainstem and you feel centered again. You can go, yeah, I'm in control. I'm at home. I can just chill a little bit. So uncross your legs, uncross your arms, sit up in the chair a little bit, and I just want you to breathe with me three times. Okay. Pardon? No, 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 I just want you to uncross your legs, actually. Just, just so that you can breathe better. That's, that's great. That's good. That's good. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. No, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so just breathe in with me, nice and deeply. In and hold and out and hold and in and hold and out and hold. And in, and hold, and out, and hold. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In that short few seconds, yes, you've got more oxygen in your system, but you had a bit of time to be aware of your surroundings, to feel, oh, I'm sitting here. I'm part of a group of people. I can chill. I can just feel at home for a few minutes. So the take home message for serotonin is do what you can to feel at home. Relax and see what you can to make somebody else feel at home. See if you can make somebody else feel at home in your presence and for you to feel at home in other people's presence. And if you get that kind of feel in your day to day interactions, your stress levels will go down and your serotonin levels will go up. Endorphins. Endorphins, it's a very strange word. We actually made it up by looking at the word endogenous, which means from the inside. And then we put it together with a word called morphine, uh, a painkiller. So we took endo, and then we took the orphine, and we put it together, and we made endorphine, because it is the chemical, the morphine, that the brain makes for itself inside. There are about 20 or more different types of endorphins and endorphins like morphine control pain. But that's not the only thing that they do. What is well known in our society is that if you run a lot like ours or if you row a lot like ours, you will get a runner's high or a row is high, you will feel this release of endorphins in your brain to take you out of pain when you go past a, a, pain, a pain threshold. Now that's well known, and I put it to you that that's a well known scientific fact because we live in an individual society. Endorphins get released anytime you're with somebody else. In fact, I'll give you some more important ways that endorphins are released. Endorphins get released during laughter. Laughter is an amazing thing. It unites the thinking frontal lobe with your feeling limbic system and gives you a shared experience with somebody else. When you laugh with somebody, you feel united with that person. All of a sudden, if, if there's somebody that you don't like, but you share a laugh, you go, oh, you know what? You're not too bad. That's what happens. Just share a beer and a laugh and the endorphins flow. That's wonderful. Norman Cousins wrote a book called The Anatomy of an Illness and what he said, well, he had this terrible disease of the spine which kept him in pain a lot. He said, if I get 10 minutes of a really good belly laugh, that will keep me out of pain for two hours. 
That's pretty good. That's better than some of our painkillers. But if you can share it with other people, then the laugh becomes better. As you know, I'm a musician. Music making releases endorphins. Not just because of the music itself, but because you're with a group of people. I used to play with an orchestra. And so just for a while, I want you to imagine that you're a clarinetist in an orchestra. Now, you get sort of these runny bits that become part of the texture, and every now and again you get a solo, but you know that you're part of something bigger than yourself, right? You've got to come in at the right time, you've got to concentrate, you've got to do all of that. You can't sort of say to the conductor, look, stop, stop, sorry, um, um, foot hurting too much, can't play. Sorry, guys. It just doesn't happen, and it does happen as a musician that sometimes you will find yourself in pain, and you go, okay, pain doesn't matter at the moment, I need something to keep me out of pain. And the body says, that's fine, we're doing music, release endorphins. Anything you do with people releases endorphins for this reason, I believe, to keep us socially together. To keep us together because if we can stay together in harmony like an orchestra, then we will have a better chance of surviving this whole life together. But anything you do releases endorphins when you do it together with other people. Singing, if you are in a lot of pain, join a choir. You'll be surprised how while you're singing, you're out of pain. Or if you do drumming, or if you do dancing, or anything like that will release endorphins in you. Solitaire. Solitaire is a card game. Do you remember as a child you got to play solitaire when everybody else decided to do something else? And you went, oh, it's not much fun alone, but at least I can play solitaire. Okay? Because we are all engaged with screens now, we are all playing solitaire. We are losing the fun of playing a card game together with somebody. And we go for those short pleasures because Marketing psychologists just know how to get the dopamine fix that we need to keep us away from other people. And look, you just have to spend some time on a train platform in Sydney to see everybody doing this. Or sometimes work lunches are now full of this. When people used to talk, and yes, you get little dopamine hits from the screens, but there is no endorphin release. Anything you do with people, Talking, playing, sex, it all releases endorphins. All right, so we've gone through dopamine for pleasure. We've gone through serotonin for feeling at home and relaxed. And we've gone through endorphins to keep connected with other people and laughing. Oxytocin. Oxytocin is my favorite brain chemical. It is the one that I work with the most when I work with somebody in psychotherapy. Oxytocin is called the hug drug or the love drug. Oxytocin is present any time this happens. Let's shake on it. Let's trust each other. Whenever you get that feeling of having made the deal, one of the good feelings about that is not having made the money but going, we made a deal. We trust each other. We shook on it. It's going to happen. Trust. When you have more trust, you have more oxytocin, which will lead to more trust and more oxytocin. So we have to be able to trust each other for that to happen. Birthing suites are full of oxytocin. We first discovered oxytocin because it was the signal that let's begin this birthing process. And those moments when a woman goes from incredible pain to incredible joy and gets flooded with this love, it's all mediated by oxytocin. Oxytocin mediates the letdown of breast milk. A mother just has to hear a child cry. And it's sort of like, oops, okay, good, have to feed the child. Oxytocin does that. Now I'm going to let you know just how romantic scientists can be. A scientist decided to measure oxytocin levels at her wedding. So she said to her friends, I don't want you to give any gifts. I want you to give blood. So on the day of the wedding, 
Everybody arrives, and as soon as they arrive, blood from everybody. Then they go through the ritual, the ceremony. They wait. A car arrives. She gets walked down the aisle. They say a few things up the front. Then right at that moment, just before somebody says, I now pronounce you man and wife, more blood. Blood from everybody. What she was looking for was, can we say that the more love that somebody feels, the more oxytocin that we can find in their system? And guess who had the highest rise in oxytocin? She did. A wedding is a bride's day. She felt it. Her friends, they had a small rise in oxytocin. Close family members, they had a higher rise in oxytocin. And there was only one other person that had an even higher rise in oxytocin than anybody else except her, and that was? The groom. That was the groom. And just as well he had that oxytocin rise, I tell you. Or else it would have been published in a study and he would never live that one down. Okay? But yes, he had the second highest rise in oxytocin. And she proved this is a study uh, published in 2009. She showed that the more love that people feel, the higher their oxytocin. But you have to take care of people when they have oxytocin uh, rises, when people care for each other. It is oxytocin that gets us from being attracted to somebody to being attached to somebody. I used to work in the musician's pit of some shows in Sydney a while back, and I had a friend. He was a violinist, I will call him Greg. And by interval, he was in tears. And I said, Greg, what's happened? He said, it's over. Rachel and I are not an item anymore. Now, they had been living together for four years. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's terrible. What happened? He said, I've always wanted to be honest with her. Now, that, that, that doesn't sound too bad, all right? And I said, OK. What did you tell her? I said, well, I told her that she was always going to be very important in my life, but the violin was more important. <laughs> and then I thought, Rachel, how did you last four years? Because here's the thing, who wants to play second fiddle? <laughs> <laughs> to a violin! Because if we take care of the people around us, he could have taken care of her and she would have let him keep the violin. She would have wanted his happiness as well. But when we pursue other things in front of the people who are close to us, they feel it. And the oxytocin goes down. It gets really cool. I talked to you about Marty, who came back from Afghanistan, a very angry person. He had a falling out with his son. He hadn't spoken to his son for 12 years. They had a falling out because his son declared that he was homosexual and Marty just couldn't abide by that. So they had some words. Son walked out of his life. And in the midst of psychotherapy, when we were talking about all the trauma of his life, I said, how are all your relationships going? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I may have to reconcile with my son at some stage. And so we talked about the son. And I said, well, when you're ready to do it, let me know. And so one day, he decided that he would march over to his son's place. Now, by this stage, his son had toyed with the idea of changing his sex but he was a cross-dresser. And so when Marty went to the door, he met his son wearing a dress. But Marty was there, and it wasn't too long before they started arguing again. What a lousy dad you are, or what kind of a son are you? And it all came up again, and they were flaring at each other again, so Marty turned to walk away. But just before he walked out of the gate, he turned around and he said, look, you may wear a dress, but you are still my son. And then his son uses a word that he hasn't used for 12 years. 
He says, Dad, do you want a beer before you go? So Marty went in and they shared a beer. And what's the first thing they talked about? Mum. Because mum always wants good relationship, yeah? Okay? Marty, you should talk to him, blah, 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 all of this. So they started to joke a bit. They started to talk about a few things. And look, I won't say that it was smooth sailing because it wasn't. That's a really, really difficult situation. But about once a month, they go surfing together. And here's the thing. The surfing gives them pleasure. The beer gives them pleasure. Dopamine. They're starting to understand and trust each other more. Oxytocin. The sunshine and being in each other's presence and feeling more at home again. Serotonin. The laughs that they share together and even some of the exercise they do together. Endorphins. So if you can get a full dose, DOSE, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin and endorphins, by keeping your relationships with other people, by as individuals just choosing to do more with people, make that choice to be with somebody, call somebody, reconcile with somebody that you need to reconcile with, play a game of canasta or rummy rather than on the internet something. Just do things with people. Then you will be doing all that you can to live for mental health, love, and compassion.